Marking its 75-year anniversary is NATO, keeping the peace or provoking conflict. Created after World War II to protect democracies during the Cold War, the alliance has since expanded to Russia's border after the fall of the Iron Curtain. Russia sees that as a threat. NATO sees it as security. So which is it? I'm Andrea Sankey, and today's newsmaker is NATO. When it was created in 1949, the mandate was clear. The North Atlantic Treaty Organization was to protect democracies, mostly in Western Europe, the U.S. and Canada, from the Soviet Union. By most accounts, it did its job, and when the USSR fell apart, NATO redefined its mandate and embarked on new missions, including Afghanistan, Libya, and the Balkans. But it also started adding new members, including a number of former Soviet states that bordered Russia. And that's where Moscow arguably began redefining its stance on NATO, seeing an adversary rather than a partner. Let's look now at where the organization stands after 75 years. April the 4th marks the 75th anniversary of the founding of the NATO Military Alliance. Its purpose is mutual military defense, with its key Article 5 stating that an attack on one of its members is considered an attack on all of them. The organization began with 12 members in 1949 and has since expanded to more than 30. Most recently, Finland and Sweden abandoned their long-standing military neutrality, joining in the wake of Russia's full-scale invasion of Ukraine. 32 flags flying together. They represent 32 nations working for a common purpose. To protect one billion people, prevent war, and preserve peace. The war in Ukraine has served to reinvigorate NATO, but before that, it was the target of criticism from both the former US President Donald Trump and the French President Emmanuel Macron. In 2019, Macron described NATO as experiencing brain death. Maybe a wake-up call was needed. It was given, and I accept that. I now welcome everybody to think about the priority that is to reflect on our aims and strategic objectives. With the US elections taking place in November, Donald Trump has stated that he won't quit NATO, but warns that European nations need to meet their commitments to spend 2% of their GDPs on defense. I said, you got to pay up. They asked me that question. One of the presidents of a big country stood up and said, well, sir, uh, if we don't pay and we're attacked by Russia, will you protect us? No, I would not protect you. In fact, I would encourage them to do whatever the hell they want. You got to pay. You got to pay your bills. On top of that, should he become the next U.S. president, Trump's pledge to stop funding Ukraine's military and thus, as he puts it, end the war on his first day in office will put him at complete odds with almost all of NATO's members. Throughout its 75-year history, NATO troops have rarely been used. The only member to come under attack was the US during 9-11. That prompted NATO involvement in Afghanistan. NATO troops and air power also played a pivotal role during the Balkans wars of the 1990s and were used to counter piracy off the coast of Somalia and to enforce a no-fly zone in Libya. But with NATO's recent expansion, including thousands of kilometers of border right next to Russia, is NATO really a force for defense, or is it in danger of provoking conflict? So joining me now to debate that question are, from New York, Dmitry Polyansky, the first deputy permanent representative of Russia to the United Nations. From London, we have Ian Bond. He's a former UK diplomat and now the director of foreign policy at the Center for European Reform. And from Barmouth, Wales, Paul Ingram is a contributor to NATO Watch and research affiliate at the Center for the Study of Existential Risk at the University of Cambridge. Thanks all so much for being with me. Dimitri, I'll start with you. Russia will not be celebrating the 75th anniversary. You've actually said you hope there will not be another 75 years. So why do you think NATO has been a destabilizing factor for the world, especially since the fall of the USSR? 
Well, I think it's not only my hope that there will be not another 75th anniversary, but maybe not another fifth or third anniversary. Because NATO is a factor of instability, is a threat to the world. It's a leftover from the past, it's quite clear. It's something that was uh, understandable during the uh, system, the two, two polar system when there was a Warsaw Treaty and uh, NATO. Uh, by the way, Warsaw Treaty was created six years after NATO, if I'm not mistaken. So it was a reply to this move by Western countries. Uh, in, uh, in the Pax Americana, when the world is dominated by one country, uh, the existence of NATO is logical because this is something that serves to the U.S. interests. Uh, if we are moving to the multipolar world, and that's our hope and the hope of the majority of the uh, world population, then there is absolutely no place uh, for NATO. It has played its destructive role in Yugoslavia. Exactly 25 years ago, uh, the NATO aggression against Yugoslavia uh, has started, and we all feel repercussions of it, of it uh, right now. All the problems uh, in the Balkans are stemming to, to this uh, unhappy decision, uh, unfortunate decision. It uh, has fled okay. from Afghanistan, it has devastated Libya, so I think that you can continue this, uh, this inglorious list of NATO so-called achievements. Huh. Uh, let me just clarify with you, though. Was it, you know, 25 years ago when NATO was active in Yugoslavia that Russia first really started to see the NATO alliance as a threat to Russia itself? No, I think it was much earlier uh, because uh, uh, when the, the, at the time of Perestroika and uh, when the new world was uh, shaping up, we were quite clear that uh, we don't see NATO as part of this world. It should have transformed to some kind of security organization encompassing Russia and all the others uh, organization which wouldn't uh, which wouldn't seek to protect uh, security only of one uh, country at the expense of the others or a block of countries mm. that was quite clear that was an understanding which was breached uh, after that by western leaders and that's also the root cause of uh, ma majority of the problems of today's world mm. ian i mean shouldn't should nato have have transformed I mean, even going back to the time of perestroika, was an opportunity missed there? And perhaps NATO could have worked earlier on with Russia uh, so that Russia well, may uh, not see it today working against it? Well, NATO has transformed. Um, what hasn't transformed is Russia's attitude to the outside world. Um, I'm afraid that, uh, you know, what we have seen over the last couple of decades uh, has been a reversion to type, a reversion to Russian imperial thinking and a desire to constrain the options of all of its neighbors. Uh, I was in Moscow in the mid-1990s when we had a kind of brief window of cooperation when Boris Yeltsin was the president and when actually, contrary to what Dmitry Polyansky has just said, NATO and Russia were working together in the Balkans. Uh, you know, Russia recognized as well as the West did that the responsibility for much of what happened in the Balkans lay at the door of Slobodan Milosevic. Uh, and uh, NATO troops and Russian troops were working alongside each other in Bosnia and Herzegovina. So it's a rewriting of history that Dmitry Polyansky has just perpetrated. And I'm not surprised because that's precisely what his president does, rewriting history. Let me ask Paul Ingram, who's right there? So I think, as with so many of these uh, challenges, it's far more complex. Um, look, NATO is much more powerful than Russia, and power brings uh, ability to influence outcomes. And we are in a mess today. And I don't think we can put all the responsibility at the door of Moscow. Um, equally, to put it all at the door of NATO is to miss uh, so many of the of the deeply challenging developments in the Russian Federation over the last twenty odd years. Uh, so I think I think the the rules of the game need to change, and NATO has the capacity to change them because it is so powerful in this situation. Uh, we face so many catastrophic risks uh, on on this planet. We need global cooperation. We cannot afford to simply put Putin in some kind of naughty boy box and ignore him. Uh, or, or, or worse, fight a war with him.
we need to we 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 actually need to overcome these challenges and that means inviting Russia, China and other states around the table and talking this out because I agree we don't need another 75 years of a collective al military alliance that is facing uh, adversaries outside of it. We do need the common security stru structure that Dmitry was talking about. But I don't think Russia has done enough to try to achieve that. Mm. I mean, Paul, is, is common security, is a common security structure and dialogue even possible to talk about at this point, given the positions of NATO versus Russia on Ukraine at the moment? It is a war I that, think... go ahead. Yeah, I don't think we have an alternative. Um, if we insist on uh, winning a, a total victory either side in this conflict, this war will continue and it will carry on and we will miss the opportunities to collaborate across so many other different arenas. Uh, we need to be fighting climate change together. We need to be addressing the challenges of uh, emerging disruptive technologies, uh, the emergence of uh, capabilities to wage global biological warfare. These are really serious challenges and they're not going to go away or or hesitate or wait for us to sort out our conflicts. Oh. And I do I do think that both sides in this in this particular squaring up have some responsibility both in the past and into the the resolution of this conflict. Dimitri, do you see any opportunities <laughs> for collaboration and cooperation with NATO though at this point or has it simply gone too far? Does Russia think NATO has proven itself an actual enemy of Russia today? Well, judging from what uh, Jan has just said, I, th I don't think there are any opportunities and uh, possibilities to collaborate with that NATO that Jan is describing. This is uh, something that is lays, lies at the core of uh, every world problem. And of course, the, the mission of NATO right now is very much compromised. Uh, this is only serving the US uh, interests and NATO is nothing but a pack of uh, lab dogs of the United States, which are not capable of oh. individual defense, only only NATO defense collective. Uh, and uh, without US, they, they can't do anything. And what we are seeing right now is uh, totally proving uh, this fact. Go ahead, Ian. Uh, I, I'm, I'm sorry, but I mean, it is nonsense to describe this as serving the interests of the, the US exclusively. I mean, the fact is that NATO members in Europe see NATO as a way to protect themselves and not least to protect themselves against Russian aggression. I mean, it's NATO that invaded Ukraine. It is Russia that invaded Ukraine. Um, and that is the fundamental threat to European security at the moment. And um, while I agree with Paul that obviously there are threats like climate change and so on we have to deal with, those are things that we can carry on dealing with regardless of, of uh, the relationship that we have with Russia. But we have a fundamental security threat in Europe at the moment, and that is the fact that Russia has violated the sovereignty and territorial integrity of its neighbour. Uh, Ian, quickly, let me ask you then. Oh no, You know what, Paul, if you wanted to get in there because you were referred to, go ahead. Yeah, so I was just going to say that um, unfortunately the negotiations that are um, that are being ha or, or uh, that were carrying on around climate change, around the non-proliferation treaty, uh, around uh, biological uh, issues, they're all broken. There are no negotiations going on at the moment because the West and Russia, in in separate ways, refuse to participate in these negotiations. And we have to firewall these. We have to engage because the planet can't wait any longer. We but, we have to overcome Paul, these Paul, conflicts. I, sorry, Paul, I'm not sure what you mean by saying that the climate change negotiations are not going on. I mean, the, the, uh, the, the, the COP process goes on from year to year. And, you know, countries, including NATO member states, undertake commitments to cut their CO2 emissions and so on. So, I mean, it, it does seem to me that that is actually proceeding regardless of the bad relations between the West and Russia. Well, it's proceeding at a pace that is totally woefully inadequate to the challenges that we face. And so you uh, think this it's will hindering... get worse. It, yeah, it's I, it's I, another I no consequence of, of this poor relationship 
uh, with NATO. But yes. I, I, let me go back to NATO. And, Ian, I'm going to come back to you quickly because, you know, French President Emmanuel Macron has just said that Europe needs to stop relying on the U.S. to defend NATO. I, I need you to explain why he's saying that, and, and, in, and is he right? Is Russia correct when it says that NATO strictly really works in the interest of a kind of uni-powerful state that is the U.S. In, the, in NATO's context? No, I mean, in fact, NATO works in the interests of its weaker members, uh, which is to say the Europeans. And what's quite striking is that if you look um, at, at what's happened to NATO over the last 30 years, uh, it's the Europeans who, on the whole, have rather kind of relaxed and are spending much less on their defence than they, they used to. And I think Macron is right to say that now, uh, particularly you know, with the possibility, at least, of Trump coming back to the White House, Europeans need to step up. They need to start taking their defence more seriously, as they did during the Cold War. Mm. Dimitri, do you think... I mean, you can tell us, actually. Is Russia looking forward to the possibility of Trump coming back to power in the United States and what that might mean for the NATO alliance? Well, frankly, I don't know what it may mean uh, to NATO alliance uh, because I think it's quite illustrative that everybody starts to panic in Europe when there is a prospect of Trump coming and uh, withdrawing from NATO. That shows uh, the, real, the real state of autonomy of NATO, contrary to what uh, Jan is saying. As for us, uh, I think that uh, my president said it repeatedly that Biden is more predictable to us. I don't know. We, we worked with Trump. I don't think that it was a good time and the majority of, uh, of anti-Russian measures that were introduced were introduced by Trump. We do not forget about this. I don't think that we will benefit from either Trump or Biden because the U.S. right now is such a state that uh, it's, it has uh, Russia as an enemy everywhere. And uh, whoever comes to power, I don't think it will change a thing. That's that's the way it, it works in the U.S. right now. They need an enemy, as Jan has said. Not NATO needs, needs an adversary. Now the adversary is Russia. Now they speak about Russian aggression, but uh, they have been involved in Ukraine for many years, or, uh, long before uh, the uh, Russian special military operation. There are a lot of materials proving that uh, NATO has intervened in Ukraine before. We had a lot of proposals to NATO. We had uh, President Putin's speech in Munich in 2007, and everybody who had ears could have heard what he wanted to say. We had proposals on security treaties. So we used all the chances to really uh, find some kind of modus, modus operandi, but mm. they, we were rejected. Now I think that NATO, in a very uh, condescending and uh, phase of uh, decline, and it's only a matter of time when this will this will yield uh, concrete uh, results, uh, if, you can, if you can say okay. that there are results for this block. I mean, Paul, do you think that's fair? And clarify, if you can, what, how much you think NATO actually does mean and should mean to U.S. security and what a potential Trump presidency might mean for that. Because there's also the issue that there are Americans arguing that focusing on NATO through Washington, D.C., has been done at the expense of not focusing on China, which many Americans mm -hmm. do see as the actual threat. Or indeed, there are many Americans that see neither as threats and see this more in terms of an isolationist position. I think, I think it is right to say that things are uncertain in America at the moment uh, in relation to uh, where they put their attention. And I think that uh, that that those that it's it's impossible for us to comment with any authority as to um, which uh, angle is going to prevail. I also think that Trump himself is very unpredictable. Uh, this could easily be um, him playing out the very simplistic uh, strategies that he outlined in his book, The Art of the Deal, where he scares everybody uh, to such an extent that that they do his bidding. Uh, and that it could be that uh, Trump is just as committed to uh, some kind of confrontation in Europe as as Biden is. I I have no idea. I do think that the uh, that the debate in Washington at the moment is is um, is is far less predictable than it was ten years ago. And uh, the Republicans seem to be coming behind Trump, and Trump is 
uh, articulating a strategy that is more isolationist rather than interventionist and uh, also uh, is is willing to do deals with uh, regimes that, um, that the Biden administration would not. So oh. I, I, I find it very difficult to predict. Um, and I, I'm not surprised that many European countries are uh, responding by putting them, their uh, military uh, spending up. Uh, but at the same time, uh, we in Europe need to have a little bit more confidence, I think, because um, our military spend is already for four times, if not five times, that of the Russian Federation. Oh. And uh, and I cannot believe that, that the European capability is, is, is so weak that we seem to be running scared. Okay. Ian, I'd like to get uh, your thoughts on that as well. And if you could do please comment on, you know, the, the Americans that I mentioned that are saying, you know, the focus, too much focus has been on Russia as an adversary, investing in NATO to to fight Russia rather than keeping their eye on a much more threatening China. I mean, I think there's a bipartisan consensus in America that China poses the larger long term threat. Um, but, you know, because it's a long term threat, it doesn't mean that you ignore the shorter term threats. Uh, and I think the Biden administration has managed to do that moderately well. I would certainly challenge the idea that, you know, Biden has sought out confrontation in Europe. That certainly isn't true. Um, Trump, I think, sought out confrontation with Europe. Uh, he, he sees uh, America's traditional allies as more of a threat than America's adversaries. Um, I mean, he famously said of the European Union that uh, it was worse than China, only bigger. Um, which showed that he didn't really understand either the EU or China, I think. Mm. Um, Let but, me, uh, it, yeah. It, yeah, I'd, I'd like to go back to Dimitri then, because, you know, Russia says it had been very clear about what certain red lines were for Moscow and that NATO was crossing them by pushing membership of more former Soviet states, creeping ever closer to, to Russia's borders, all the red lines Russia says it put out were crossed by NATO, and there may be even more NATO expansion. So what is Russia's position then going forward? I, they say they're not bothered by Scandinavian countries, you know, Sweden and Finland actually joining. But if the lines go any further, what, what will Russia respond with? Well, I think we are responding uh, by conducting our special military operation, by crushing the Zelensky regime, which is uh, fed by the arms from uh, from NATO. Actually, uh, the Zelensky regime has already squandered uh, everything that it had from its uh, armaments, and now it's, it is the, the only lifeline is NATO supplies. I think we are crushing this. We are fulfilling the aims of our special military operation. We have repeatedly said that we are ready to engage in diplomatic efforts, but uh, I think that uh, the West and uh, the U.S. is not ready to this. Uh, they have some futile hopes of uh, inflicting some kind of defeat or of weakening my country. So that's why we have to, to prove that we are right at the battlefield. And I think we are doing this uh, successfully and we'll do it even more successfully. And there will be more green faces uh, in NATO and uh, in the US. You know, it's ironic, Paul, because we hear those arguing that Ukraine has actually proven NATO's worth and shown its solidarity and how important an organization it is. Well, the others that say it's NATO that has actually caused this entire conflict. And had NATO been smarter before the invasion, we wouldn't be where we are today as per the war in Ukraine. Mm -hmm. I think, Andrea, you've just summed up two very uh, valid perspectives, and they sit alongside each other in total contradiction. And I think that that reflects the, the sad situation that we're in, where people are able to hold these different perspectives with authenticity and not feel able to talk to one another, let alone um, pull pull back from uh, from fighting. I, I, I see I see truth in both those positions. And I think it's important that uh, people start to see the complexities behind these conflicts and stop just pointing the finger at one side or the other as if they carry the whole responsibility. Because if we carry on doing that, we don't actually have a hope of, of tackling the many problems that I was talking about earlier. Uh, it's, it's the only chance we have is, is talking whilst mm. we are fighting. So, Ian, is there another perspective to be considered? 
Well, I'm a great believer in the sovereignty and territorial integrity of, of states. Um, I did not think that we should have invaded Iraq, and I don't think that Russia should have invaded Ukraine. Uh, I think you know the the international order breaks down if countries think that it is their right to go and invade other countries. Um, and I think the situation in Europe would actually have been a lot better if in 2008, when NATO said that Ukraine could be out of the alliance, simply gone ahead and given Ukraine membership, which was what Ukraine was seeking at that time. The fact that we didn't, I think, acted as a provocation to Vladimir Putin. Nothing provokes Vladimir Putin as much as the weakness of his adversaries. Um, and that is how we ended up where we where we did. Ukraine is not Russia's sphere of influence. It is an independent, sovereign country, a member of the United Nations. It is entitled, as a member of the United Nations, to individual and collective self-defense. It is entitled to expect that a permanent member of the Security Council will not invade it. Okay. Ian Bond, that will have to be the final word because unfortunately we are completely out of time for this edition of the Newsmakers. Dimitri, I'm sorry for not getting back to you for a final thought, but uh, that's all the time we have. So I'd like to thank our viewers for joining us as well. Remember, you can follow us on X and do be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel. I'm Andrea Sankey. We'll see you next time.